Good morning. Let me do a little something with my hair. People don't often understand my hair. We'll be saying that in a poem later. There we go. That's better. Okay. There. All right. Um, today I'm going to start with um, a few poems about me. And then um, just to introduce what I say about war and peace. Um topic that's been on all of our minds for a long time. Um, some of you have ancestors who um, were removed by war in an untimely fashion. Um, my ancestor, Jason Ebenezer Twist, was one of the first men to die at Antietam in the Civil War, um, and that affected several generations of our family uh, who were children of war. And uh, as you may know from your own experience, children of war uh, carry losses and resentments down through several generations. Um, so that explains something about me. Uh, but I also have a hunger and thirst for peace. Um, I don't think war ever yields a solution that is better than what it was before everything was destroyed. Um, and I'll let that stand and let the poems speak for me after that. Um, these first two poems, as I said, are about me. They're not in the book War Forsaken. Um, but um, my great-grandparents, as you'll be seeing in the poems, came from um, Valenia, Poland, to escape war there. Um, one escaped. My great-grandfather, Adolf, escaped from um, the Russian-Japanese War because... Uh, he wanted something better for his children. So he went to Canada and um, then came to Michigan where many churches were supporting refugees at the time. He wrote back to his wife, Bertha, who had five children under the age of 15 at the time, said, sell everything, pack it up, come with me safely, join me in the Midwest in the USA. And she being the granddaughter of a martyr who was killed by Cossacks for his faith. And because he spoke German at home, which was resented by the Cossacks, he was kidnapped and carried away and was never heard from again, presumed dead. So uh, being the granddaughter of a man like that, she sold everything without hesitation. They escaped through the dark. Um, with the help of scouts uh, through the forests at night with about a hundred people to the German border. And about seven months later, they arrived um, to be reunited with their, her husband, Adolf, uh, who became a wheelwright um, in this area and a farmer and the father of 16 children altogether. So uh, uh, <clears throat> their daughter, was my grandmother. I'm very proud of that and so pleased they were both courageous enough to leave war behind. That's why I call this book uh, War Forsaken. So let's get started with the ones about me. This might help you understand me a little better, how I became a poet to start with. Um, I write about myself in the third person, which when you're looking back sort of makes sense because you're not that person anymore, <clears throat> only partly that person. And the memory of something is not the thing itself. And the more times you, mem you remember something, it is less and less the thing itself. So uh, these are in third person writing about me. Dear Socrates, dear compassion, Reason and resentment raised a daughter careful as an open wound. Her grandparents were the children of war relocated to freedom. Peers rejected her eagerness to learn. So from an early age, the companionship of books welcomed her. She found you, Socrates, and other immortals there, and something to love more than fantasies of motherhood. 
in a generation of strategic misinformation. She followed your clarity, Socrates, to library shelves where her name can be found in the reference section as contributor to letters about letters. She writes within the contradictions because she has not joined them yet. Not yet perfectly invisible, not yet perfect in compassion. Those eternal intangibles, Socrates, you worshiped of which you are now one. For this uh, next poem, you need to know about Kent State, if you hadn't heard about that. During the Vietnam War, protesters were being gunned down in Kent State, Ohio. A number of students were shot to death simply for protesting the war. Um, a regrettable incident. <clears throat> Everyone involved regretted it. Uh, very sad, but part of our history nonetheless. That's mentioned in this poem. Nixon's pardon is, is mentioned. Uh, Nixon is a former U.S. president uh, during the time of Kent State, during the time I was in college in the 70s. Um, his henchmen were caught uh, doing something sneaky, and he resigned as a result rather than to be tried. Um, the man he had picked as his replacement uh, pardoned him. So that's an event referred to in this poem. Um, the underwater panther mentioned at the end is a Native American construct, a, an imaginary beast uh, credited with uh, the storms that would rise up out of nowhere on the Great Lakes to cause the death of anyone traveling on the water at that time. Um, it's known, I forget its native name, but it's also known as the underwater panther. Okay, so here he is also in the third person and about me. A Midwestern education, a modifier dangling between ego and the clock in the crocodile, hopes to become a proper noun. She studied humanities taught by King Richard III. She studied comparative religions on a hunt for a system that allows football and chocolate after death. New Age philosophy asked her to prove God from a presupposition of his non-existence, to find truth by ignoring what is known. That issue did not arise with Socrates. So she kept reason and ditched contemporary philosophy because the statement, there is no such thing as absolute truth, denies its own validity. She wrote her report card to the money's edge. She would have been a journalist, but it was the age of Kent State and Nixon's pardon. And she was dedicated to the truth, unpopular truth. She has seen the male prostitute praying in tongues, the guru eating roast pig at a biker picnic. She suspects the serial killer hides something at some extraordinary gentleness, like a sable coat found in a bomb factory, simply because he loves the way she can harmonize to early Bob Dylan. Everything she needs to know about enemies, she learned at home like the rest of her generation. She almost died on the Great Lakes, but the legendary underwater panther decided not to take her on. <clears throat> the next is a poem called Only So Much. Some of you might remember in Europe there was a poet who became a president of a European country. I forget his name, but uh, it was interesting to watch him being in a community of poets at the time to see what he would do with his role in politics. So this is Only So Much. I was cleaning a bed and breakfast when I wrote this uh, called the Inn at Union Pier. Um, wonderful place. Only so much. 
during the day between the captain's room with the brass jacuzzi and between the Four Seasons building, I make beds, rub sunblock lotion into wood furniture, sweep leaves off walkways. On hands and knees, I reset fires in Roman tile stoves. Then I wipe vinegar water into wooden floors to erase footprints of visitors from many countries. Why do they leave half-empty wine bottles on the tip table? There's only so much a poet can do with stale wine. In a dream, I attend a poetry conference in a foreign country. Protesters gather in the streets. The poor want us to tour the iron factory. You poets, why don't you do something meaningful, they shout. Has hunger made them forget history? Haven't we already seen there is only so much a poet can do with an iron factory? Production of frying pans, lawn furniture, fireplace grates, and when these don't sell, bars for prison cells, gun production, you see the problem. I published a chapbook that's a small a uh, group of poems, usually 30 to 50 poems under one cover. Um, I design and I sew them together myself. I, I uh, published War Forsaken some years ago, and by now all the poems have been revised. So if you happen to have a copy of that rare book, um, you won't recognize these poems because I've changed them, hopefully for the better. Here's Born to Say It. I have sometimes dressed inappropriately on a dare. People don't understand my hair. I'm not political, but I have written to the editors of newspapers often. When protesters of the war were being hated as traitors, I call them the true patriots. Many years later, I said, the gender wars stole the civil rights movement. Yet we still do not have a revolution that goes all the way to equal partnerships with mutual respect, free of dominance games. I said, all lives matter, even the black unborn. The movements didn't like me. There are more important things than to be liked. Music, Shakespeare, the Bible, and Les Miserables went with me into the prisons to open the future. I told the lifers, you are skilled liars. You might make good actors. Now, five years later, Les Mis was touring the world. What if Muslim countries had more translators, choirs, orchestras, opera, book fairs, tractor pulls, pool tables, theaters, Rodeos, bowling alleys. What if Muslim countries had roller coasters, car races, baseball games, poetry readings, tennis courts, basketball hoops, the foundations of freedom? What if hatred of women was not a religion? I ask many unpopular questions. I forget to watch clocks. I could be more organized. I could run for local office. I could have studied law. Some fear what will happen when I get my act together. How did I get to be a person like this? This one's called suburban school. We were all raised uh, in my generation in the shadow of nuclear war that we were told repeatedly was able to destroy the world multiple times in a row, which was impossible, but potentially could happen. And here we are, 60 years later, <laughs> still here. A miracle, truly a miracle given human nature and the economic problems we've had. 
Ah, suburban school. There is a strategy to do well in school. One has to embrace lectures, books, and tests as good friends. Easy for me since my classmates did not want to be my friends. You see, I came to school already able to read. I never understood that. To turn envy into friendship, to turn rejection into forgiveness, it takes more than to study well. There is a strategy to winning childhood games. It helps you lose to lose sometimes. Loss didn't happen to me often back then. I felt like the lonely earth we saw from the men on the moon, a shiny blue-green marble surrounded by darkness. Numbers, not like words, have steady values, predictable relationships, so math was easy for me. Comforting compared to the unexpected classroom news in, from the TV that our president had been shot or the bomb shelter drills. We were told when the sirens sounded to sit under our desks, tuck our heads under our folded arms. Though it was never explained how to do that would shield us from nuclear blast. To do well in school, it is a good strategy not to ask the teacher aloud if to sit under our desks simply allows others to identify charred remains. Another thing that happened in my childhood was um, to find a book in a place that didn't really belong. Uh, one of many anomalies in my life that educated me quickly called Atrocities, um, the Book of Atrocities, an encyclopedia of the horrible things people have done to each other through history, full color illustrated. Amazing. What else do you need to know about this? Um, oh, I mentioned some poets. Uh, Jalaluddin Rumi, he was a uh, Christian dervish of the 12th century. I believe it was the 12th century. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, Rainer Maria Rilke, a German poet. Um, whom grief almost silenced until he was able to do his heart work. Uh, John Donne, a very passionate man who became a Christian cleric. Um, Shakespeare you recognize, hopefully. Um, and uh, that's all you need to know before I read this. Atrocities robbed. I cannot imagine anything more distant from the love of God than the book of atrocities left in the suburban church sanctuary for me to find at age nine. It was a full color history of the destruction of temples, sacrifice of infants, technologies of torture, human torches, mass enslavements, mass graves, all invented by the family of man. Until later, I learned my ancestor, a man of faith and peace, had been kidnapped by Cossacks who carried him away to never be heard from again. How far away did the love of God seem for his children on that day? The telescope large enough to see one human clearly from deep space would have to be larger than I can calculate though similar calculations are made in the artist's brush strokes, the dancers reach by the ambitions of any growing thing. The poets Rumi, Rilke, John Donne, and Shakespeare, and many others wrote from distances that great, wrote as though the soul of man inhabits even deep space where crimes cannot reach them, and there is nothing more important 
than to say so. I had a Fox Terrier Smooth, um, who was the love of my life during my recovery from severe PTSD. Uh, if you listen to all of these, you'll eventually find out about the causes of that. Um, and uh, we were out walking uh, one spring day, and we saw some hawk justice. Winter disturbs us. What we must do to enjoy this day is don jackets, leash the dog to sniff the daily animal news, search tree limbs for rising buds. Melting snow reveals where a blue jay met its Arab spring. The blue jay had it coming, ruining the nests of other birds just because it could. The hawk left nothing but a pile of blue feathers. A bully was taken down. Even nature punishes bullies, my dog says. There's some poetry in that. Where is the spiritual hawk to take down all human aggression based in hatred, bent on destruction of the vulnerable? Come to our world. Hawk of correction, hawk of compassion, take hold of the bully spirit and shake it to scraps so that the nonviolent can raise their young in safety and peace. During that year, uh, 2012, uh, we had anomaly weather. Um, Summer happened in February. It was followed by a drought. And um, then the rains came back eventually. But um, this poem starts with reference to that. Um, I kept at that time a rescue garden. Um, I would find wildflowers growing in places where they were just going to be mowed down. And I would move them to a secret place behind a row of garages and a fence. And um, it was a narrow strip, but, but it got enough sunlight to, to raise this garden. Um, that was my secret garden. And um, Tiananmen Square, we remember the slaughter that happened there in the 80s when um, people rose up to, to change the system, as was the plan from the beginning by the, by the uh, system. And uh, instead, they were all shot down. Um, terrible event in human history. I think of them. I think of those martyrs every day. I think of the ones who reluctantly shot them every day. Um, what else you need to know? A glyph is a written symbol that stands for something else. Um, as in hieroglyph, it's it's a picture that stands for something. Um, Cairo is Greek words for um, the P and the cross at the end, which is the sign for Christ. Uh, Christ was the Greek idea of a sacrifice that would save the world. Um, Okay, so at this time also there was talk of revolution in Egypt and other Muslim countries. And um, that is where the term from the previous poem, Arab Spring, came from. This poem is How Does Crocus Know Better? 80 degrees sunlight in February hugs our bare skin. For a week we dress for the beach when in a month that usually calls for heavy coats. The dog is happy to sniff animal news without any new snow. A mob of narcissists risen this week calls to mind the excitement and warning of Tiananmen. How does Crocus know better than to rise too soon in record heat? 
In the rescue garden, climbing roses were mowed down in the name of fire safety. Broken catalpa and honeysuckle twigs form involuntary messages. Here is a glyph that means contentment in Chinese, some distance away from a partly formed Cairo. We marvel what this means for all within us that is tempted to open too soon, that should know better than to believe in false spring. Uh, if you know people who've been involved in the military, this experience might um, resonate with you. Um, it's called Undisturbed. After losing a friend to war, he asked me what he dared not cry aloud at the time. Why was he taken and not me? He waited for my answer. The voice of nature answered, Inner peace can flower when you find no fault with events as they unfold, apart from your desires. What we grasp for support is not always guaranteed to be there. Comfort your heart within you like a small child within you like King David often did. Forgive the evil that took your friend and left you behind. Bitterness kills those who drink from it. You want more than that. After your heart lands in peace, undisturbed, when you find no fault with the number of your days, you will know you have been spared for a purpose. Others will see in you a light like the fireflies, living fire, the same fire that formed animals out of the earth's new dust. Fog lifting. For those recently born, you're not aware that the two towers in the United States, uh, the World Trade Center, were uh, destroyed by airplanes that impacted them. Um, and uh, the countries where Asia and Persia used to be were blamed and um, attacked by the United States. And so there was war in Iraq where they were looking for weapons of mass destruction because they blamed them for the falling of the two towers. It was the first time that America had been attacked within its own borders. The world wars had happened overseas in other countries. We were stunned. We didn't know what to do. Um, and thanks to people like David Letterman and uh, journal, certain journalists who were brave enough, uh, Tom Brokaw, others, uh, Al Roker, um, brave enough to address the nation not knowing what to say, somehow found the right things to say to get us rolling again. I remember that time. Um, now I have quite a few Muslim neighbors. I have... I, I, every day I meet a woman in a burqa, we smile at each other, we laugh. It's a wonderful thing. Um, so we've reached some kind of peace and understanding about that uh, regrettable time in our history as a world. So this begins with reference to that war, to the two towers that fell and... Uh, the other thing you need to know here, um, Allen Ginsberg wrote a poem, Howl, which was his rant against the sacrifice of the innocent in the modern world, um, which he likened to worship of the god Moloch, who required infant sacrifice. Um, an ugly thing for sure. Um, a burqa is the uh, head head scarf that um, 
women in many Muslim countries are required to wear that hides their hair and sometimes includes a veil to hide the lower part of their face. Um, I do have some Muslim ancestors, interestingly enough, which is pretty fascinating, I think. Uh, they were married to my Byzantine emperor's uh, ancestors, and some of the Byzantine princes became Muslims, and that spared them from being destroyed. Uh, that way I became, I was, I was born from them because a Muslim conqueror spared the Byzantine emperor because of his Muslim son. A lot of poetry in that too. Here we go back to the poem, Fog Lifting. Dust disturbed by bombs over what was once Persia, cruel Persia, land of cruel Sargon, must have hung like thick fog after twin towers fell. Was Persia to blame? To blame or not, state-endorsed rape rooms had to be destroyed. A layer of cold air trapped between warm air and a warm pond turns into fog. Without visibility, my dog navigates by nose. We are getting our fresh air fix on the half Negro president streets at dawn. Like Ginsburg, we walk hidden by fog. Like Ginsburg plotting against his rant, plotting against Moloch, we walk hidden by fog. In Muslim countries, the women are compelled to hide their faces from the men. Why is that needed if the men are so moral? In my country, Muslims with Christian mothers-in-law love their new country and work for peace. Christians with Muslim mothers find safety in a land of freedom. Far back in time, we all had the same grandmothers Kindness, patience, and faith are a common ground. The fog of divisions in our lands lifts gently as women with braided hair beside women wearing burqas see each other clearly for the first time in the gardens we call home. We all hope this means lasting peace. Okay. Um, murmuring birds needs to be illustrated here. Uh, a murmur of birds is when you look out across the sky and it appears to be a black cloud, but it's really a reunion of maybe thousands of birds flying together in formation that keeps changing. It's ju just an amazing thing to witness. It's called a murmur of birds. Um, we saw that this day. An anomaly is something that breaks pattern. Um, so at one time, the name of all these poems together was called Anomaly Almanac. You've been looking for that. They're now... Um, split up under different uh, different titles, in case you wondered what happened to that book. This is called Drenched. After three rainless months, rain's unanimous benediction, drums lightly on the carport tin, for two going on three days uninterrupted. Frogs and crickets sing again. Murmuring birds return. Dare we hope this time in a year of anomalies, normal has come back to stay? With stronger faith, even in times of war, we would know compassion and human unity are the rule, even if rare. And peace that most people desire will rule again if we refuse to give in to despair.
Um, this one refers to the Holocaust, the genocide um, that took place after the genocide that took place in North America um, that was never called a genocide until recently. And that was the destruction of the Native American tribes across uh, both North and South America to make way for European expansion. Um, and Europe may find it ironic that America objected most strongly to the destruction of Jews um, by the Nazis. Uh, and some are so embarrassed by that event, they're trying to say it never happened. We can't afford to forget those things. There have been other genocides. Um, there are some going on now. And um, in the Ukraine, for example, there's never again. A uh, stirrup hoe, uh, gardeners understand, a stirrup hoe has um, a just flat knife blade at the bottom and a stirrup shape above it on a handle. And you can drag that underneath plants and it will cut off the roots. Uh, so it's the fastest way to clear a garden of weeds. Um, and I mentioned that at the beginning. Um, I uh, lost an, a great uncle at Somme in France during World War I. And um, so many lives were spent besides the ones killed by the Nazis. There were many lives sacrificed to try and make that stop. My poem about this is never again. The stirrup hoe erases unwanted weeds in one hour. The same kind of clearing applied to human life is the stuff of nightmares. Ancestry search finds nine Polish siblings and their cousins all have the same death date. They spoke German in the Ukraine at the end of World War II, lined up and shot by haters they were bulldozed into a mass grave. It is only below heaven that to be unwanted can be fatal. Glory holds no ranking system. In the eyes of living light, all are wanted without regard to labels. All human distinctions drop away in human death which is never the end of the story. Survivors of genocide, freed from bitterness, turn nightmares into gardens. Armed with flowering saplings and flowering shrubs, they say aloud to evil, never again. Um, I emerged from the Detroit area, having been tortured in my own home for years um, uh, with severe PTSD. And um, once after I had um, visited a place where I had once been a teacher, I um, attended a demonstration of a keto. Um, if you know karate, you know about Aikido. Aikido is a nonviolent method of self-defense that uses the enemy's power against them without exerting any power at all. This 80-year-old had uh, reduced a black belt in karate to a twisted form on the floor, breathing heavily. Um, it was quite a display. It all, only took a few minutes, and he was smiling the whole time. I watched in amazement. And this poem was the result. The master's secret. Survivor of every kind of attack. She asks the Aikido master, survivor of three wars. How do you stay calm when the attacker comes right at you? Welcome hostility as you would welcome a friend, he said. 
His smile convinces her that it works. After all, you cannot prove your inner strength without him, he says. She says she does not think she could pretend like that, the memory of pain and deep tissues holding on. I did not say to pretend, he smiles. Be calm. See how to work the attacker's own energy against him without causing harm. When you have won, not by striking blows, but by not letting attack sink into you, lift up your enemy, love him like a dear friend from the heart without fear, since you have overcome. She asks, what if I can't overcome? It is yourself you must overcome, he said. Then the rest will be easy. Um, during that that drought year, um, I was working on a golf course and I was the zinnia lady. I was in charge of planting the zinnias that my boss loves the most and from seed carried over from year to year. Um, I couldn't wait for the gardening season. So my apartment balcony was full of trays of seed getting started early because the uh, other boss I worked for there complained that zinnias didn't bloom fast enough. So uh, we had to get some started in early March, late February, so that hopefully they would bloom uh, in June sometime when normally zinnias don't come to full bloom until July. Um, gardeners already know that. <laughs> I have a bag of zinnia seeds in my laundry room right now. Um, this is called One Victory. In a crowded zinnia bed, the ones planted early look no different from the ones planted later. It is one garden with one victory over the drought, no matter where or when the individuals began to reach for light. It is that way where souls have gone, even souls who have been at war with one another, all their divisions fallen away in death. the great unity of oneness restored in the unity of everlasting love. Okay, um, here's the poem called War Forsaken. Praise be outside of self-defense. We can forsake war and live through it. I am the third generation seed of a man forced into war who forsook war and lived through it. He dropped an ill-fitting Russian uniform just outside of Japan, crossed oceans to freedom, then wrote to his wife, I want no more of war. Our children deserve better. Sell the farm, join me. We have many friends here. Hidden by dark of night, she and five babies escaped through the forest to the border, through France, through Britain, across the sea, to land in their new home many months later, shaped like the hand of God. You know, my state is shaped like the hand of God. <laughs> they came here. What can we say about how long it takes to reach freedom? Are seeds of freedom in other nations waiting for best timing? All who love freedom are free. 
We wonder how long before sprouts rise under a starless ceiling from cups of expired seed. Well, let's see what we've got to go on here yet. Um, one of the poems I wrote um, regarding the years of torture I survived also resonates to prisoners of war. Uh, if you've ever been detained in prison for even something you did yourself, you might feel this way sometimes. Um, I was a teacher in the prison system um, here when I had come out of graduate school, and I often wondered what would happen if all the lifers would suddenly start singing. <laughs> Other ways to sing. Dedicated to prisoners of war. It's from a group, group of poems I, I wrote um, called What Happened. In 10 years of silence, one finds other ways to sing after emerging from torture. It is a kind of singing to clean a sink, to sweep a hospital, to shovel snow, to bring wildflowers into secret gardens a kind of music made with watercolors and a brush. Harmony come together from three strands of yarn on long needles. It is a song to give the scarred rescue dog three ham bones in the same day. Because even after body, mind, and soul have been pounded without mercy for no good reason, music's inner heart light endures. It lets the healing sink in. Reason and right. After war reshuffled everything, my neighbor thought he knew. He comes home to find home is not the way he left it. Where the witch hazel stood, there is sand and gravel. The house high tamarack, gone. The aged Spanish bachelor and the man with a pink baseball cap both gone, released from pain to the sky. The geese loaded into cages were carted away. Their relatives, missing them, sit moaning on the ice, making cries almost human. Abandoned cars in the next door lot sport support our troop signs on cars as if he needs reminders of years he will never be rid of and never get back. Small children laugh in the neighbor's yard, born when he was away. Their voices in sunshine tell him what he did had reason and every right to succeed. There are more poems in that, but I'm still working on the updating, uh, updated revisions because now, of course, war has broken out again in the Ukraine. And um, that resonates with uh, what I've written about my, my relatives who came from that same landscape uh, 
to my landscape. And um, thus I was born in the United States, the best country in the world, not without its contradictions, um, and yet um, still the best place to live in my estimation. Um, I'm very fortunate to have been born here and not in the countries right now torn by war. Um, for what reason? Why does a country as large as Russia need the countries around it? I better stop there. <laughs> um, why do we need war? Um, Chelo Miwash, a Lithuanian who was a second generation refugee from the Holocaust uh, in Europe, said that war is a failure of human intelligence. And I'll come back to another Poets Aloud reading to finish up War Forsaken next time. Um, thank you for listening. Have a great day.